of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Canberra region on whose lands we are meeting today and to pay our respects to their elders past and present. Okay, um, today we've had a late scratching. Uh, Steve Laid has COVID. Uh, the poor fellow has been laid up for over a week. Uh, special thank you to Jack Pezzi for jumping in uh, the breach without any notice at all. Much appreciated, Jack. Um, and today our talks range from molecules to other planets. And Jack is somewhere in between proposing better ways to look after the one planet we currently have. Uh, but first of all, we're going to start off with Mark. Over to you, Mark. What to expect when you reach Mars, a guide for colonists. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so when I saw this call for flash talks, um, at first I thought, no, I can't, I can't do that. Not in the time available because it was short notice. But then I thought it will be an opportunity to combine my um, professional career um, as an ecologist with my hobby, uh, which is what got me into uh, science in the first place, of astronomy. So I am going to be talking about some of the far reaches of the fantasies of the tech bros uh, today. So fasten in for a rough ride. So I'm going to be talking about what to expect when you reach um, Mars. So, okay, that's not working. <laughs> I'll just go down. Okay. All right. Um, so here's an outline of the talk. I'll start with a brief digression for, for geeks into the technology that we use in amateur astronomy. Then the guts of the talk is, is all about the environment of Mars compared to the Earth's. And then I'm going to finish with some sort of uh, amateur, amateur psychology where we try and explore the motivations of the, of the supposed colonizers, uh, what's driving these guys. So, um, so first then, this brief digression. So when I was a kid in the, um, in the 1960s who wanted to be uh, an astronomer, this was kind of the image that you see here of Jupiter was the kind of the best thing that people could do. And it took a vast technology to do that. This telescope here was uh, used to take the picture of Jupiter. You can see a satellite of Jupiter by the side there in the shadow on the surface of the planet. Um, but it, it was a five meter telescope. So the, um, the, the telescope mirror there is about five meters, five meters in, in diameter. Now, not a, to be honest, not a terribly impressive um, image of Jupiter. And this is what I was able to do uh, in 2017 with a telescope about, about that diameter in my backyard. And uh, I think you'll agree without, without bragging, it's a, better, it's a better image. It's a far better image and a much more satisfying one with subtle colors. And yes, yes, it's, nothing's changed apart from that. So that is again uh, uh, a shadow of one of the satellites, although somewhere out here. So, um, so things have come on. So the big change is in information technology. We don't use photographic plates anymore. We use video cameras like this one. Um, take high speed video, 100 to 200 frames per second. We use software to stack those frames to create um, a, a sharpened and higher resolution image like this one. Um, so a lot of the, the change is really in the, is in the IT. So um, most, most or all, all of the images here, except where otherwise stated, are, are my images from the backyard. So um, uh, just to keep it real as it were. Um, so now we'll move on and have a look at the environment of Mars compared to Earth's. But let's, let's hear from Elon Musk this is on, from the SpaceX uh, website with this rather circular argument here. Uh, you want to wake up in the morning and think the future is going to be great. And that's what being a spacefaring civilization is all about. It's about believing in the future and thinking that the future will be better than the past. And I'm here to show that if, if you're living that future on Mars, it won't be that much better. In fact, it will be quite a bit worse. So um, Mars is the fourth planet from the sun. Uh, it's about half the diameter of the Earth. 
Um, and it's got a very eccentric orbit, so it varies in distance uh, from 200 to 250 million kilometers from the sun. The, uh, the year on Mars is about two Earth years, slightly under two Earth years, and the day length is uh, just slightly over ours. So quite similar in an eerie, uncanny way. It's even got a sort of Africa there in the in the middle of the of the, of the field, uh, upside down, of course, from our point of view. Uh, here's the southern polar cap, and you can see a slight glazing of water vapor clouds uh, here in this image. It's not one of my best, but it's interesting for what it reveals. So here's a, a picture for people of a certain age. David Bowie's uh, PM to the angst of a teenage girl wishing for a more exciting life. And it turns out that astronomers have a similar yearning for a more exciting life, but it centers on is there life on Mars uh, in, in reality. So uh, back in the early 20th century, late 19th century, the images or the, the, the views of, of Mars that people were getting from the telescopes of the, of the time had these sort of linear structures, which are actually geological structures, but which led them to uh, posit that uh, these were seas, these darker patches, and that there were deserts, and that there was a civilization digging canals to move water about, which led to this kind of um, intense pseudoscience. So, so beware of pseudoscience, kids. So um, we now know that there is, in fact, watch David Bowie, there is no life on Mars. Uh, but there may well be evidence of early early life when there was free water billions of years ago on the planet. So a fair amount of the research into life on Mars focuses on that. Um, this seems to be working now, by the way. I don't know what I've done. Anyway, um, so survival on Mars. So landing on Mars is more challenging than the moon. Obviously, we've landed people on the moon. Why can't we do it on Mars? Firstly, it takes six months to get there. Uh, bags, I'm not sitting next to Elon Musk for six months. Uh, then there's the acceleration due to gravity that you that, that's three times that on the moon. So you're coming in faster. You've got a thin atmosphere, but it can still cause burn up of the, of the capsule if you enter too fast, but it's not thick enough to sort of glide in. So, uh, so you've got a lot of technical problems. The, you, you might recall the um, European space probe, the Beagle, that, that just splatted like Wile E. Coyote onto the surface back in 2003. Um, very difficult technical challenge to land things gently on the planet. The atmospheric pressure is a tiny fraction of the Earth's, uh, and most of that atmosphere is carbon dioxide, which ends up freezing around the, the, the pole every uh, southern winter. Um, radiation levels, there's no magnetic field on Mars, so the radiation from the sun and the cosmos just hits the surface. Um, but meanwhile, the temperature average is minus 63. So not such a lot of fun. So the Martian movie, I was asked to, to have a sidebar on the Martian movie. It gets a lot right. It's a wonderful film for conveying what it would be like to live on Mars, and it gets some of the orbital dy dynamic stuff really right. Um, but there are too many windows in the base. There are radiation effects. Winds shown are too violent. Um, so things, because the atmosphere is so thin, it, buff it doesn't buff it in the way that it's shown on the movie. So the, mo the winds are 200 kilometers per hour, but so, so uh, dispersed that you don't get that pressure. And um, don't eat potatoes grown in your own poo on Mars, uh, as uh, Matt Damon did, uh, because the soils are full of heavy metals and they'll make you a bit sick and peaky like Matt looks uh, here after a few weeks. Um, so a few aspects of survival on Mars. Um, the climate, it's a bit brisk. So from Whitaker 1967, you remember this famous um, outlay. Elon Musk's home is here, uh, roughly speaking, near the SpaceX base, and here's Mars. <laughs> so, not hugely attractive. Barbecues have become less attractive in those conditions, I can say, as an ex Englishman. So, uh, dust storms. This is another aspect of Mars. Um, 
Uh, here you can see on the uh, on the left a, a, a video image uh, showing the arrival of a dust storm in June 2018, which I was able to image, and I'll show you in the next uh, slide. But just look at how the light uh, gets blocked until you end up sitting for months um, in something like northern England uh, for uh, with 99% of the light blocked. So, so. So what I did uh, in 2018 from the backyard uh, was image the progress of the dust storm, um, and here's that here's the spot where the video on the other on the previous slide was taken, uh, around about the same time actually, um, and then to compare you can see here from 2020 a dust-free Mars showing what you ought to be able to see. So you can see the sort of thick blanket that persists uh, persists for months. So again, a bit like living in Northern England in, in my childhood. But um, so last aspect of living on Mars is this attempt to re-engineer it for, for humans. So here's a bit of sort of tech boosterism from the SpaceX website. Mars is one of Earth's closest habitable neighbors with habitable doing quite a bit of heavy lifting <laughs> in, that, in that sentence, I think you'll agree. So it's got decent sunlight. It's a little cold, but we can warm it up. Its atmosphere is primarily CO2. That sounds like a negative to me, but <laughs> it means that we can, we can grow plants on Mars just by compressing the atmosphere. Again, heavy lifting from just there. Uh, Gravity is about 38% of that of the Earth, so you'd be able to lift heavy things and bound around. And this, as a guy who's in his uh, late 60s, that, that sounds appealing. Um, and the day length is remarkably close to that of Earth. So you'll be able to get lots of work out of your uh, surfs, you know, to uh, have a similar day length. So, yeah, but as, a, as an ex-invasion um, ecologist, I'm a bit skeptical about re-engineering ecosystems uh, to help us uh, uh, survive. And so here's an example from the Savannah Zone where we introduced hundreds of legumes and grasses to transform the savannas into something more recognizably grazable. Um, we got four useful species out of that and 60 weeds. And we also, there's also the rabbits and cane toad story, which are all well-intended uh, attempts to uh, man manipulate the environment in our favor. So I, I am skeptical. Um, I'm running out of time. So I want to go look at the motivations of colonizers very briefly, what's driving them? So there's the, the first idea um, from my reading is the one around manifest destiny, the 19th century idea that white Christian people need to move across landscapes and colonize them and make them productive. You get a lot of that kind of ethos coming through in this literature. There's a misanthropic driver of, I can't stand all these smelly people around me, I want to move somewhere else and, and be in close confines with smelly people, I guess. Libertarianism, free me from free me from the the shackles of of, uh, of government, and then there's one that I guess I can understand: uh, techno optimism. I I'm into technology, and I'd kind of be fascinated to see a base on Mars. So that drives some of these people. Um, but I think there are theses to be written about this. Really, it's a very interesting phenomenon, and so. I would argue, and I'm sure I'm, you share my view, that we should fix what we're doing to planet Earth. Um, we've got six of nine planetary boundaries crossed as of 2023. Venus shows us what happens if you have 97% uh, carbon dioxide in your atmosphere. You get a surface temperature of 470 degrees centigrade. So good for barbecues, I suppose. But, um, but I'll finish off by showing a picture of... of uh, of two organisms, one of which is 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 a malignant force across the landscape and exudes toxins if you approach it, and the other is a cane toad. <laughs> so, so uh, with that cheap shot, <laughs> uh, with that cheap shot, that's the end of my talk. There's a summary, a reminder of what I spoke about, and a an uh, animation showing Mars rotating over an hour from my backyard. So, thank you. Uh, question. I want to propose not a, or ask not ask a question, but propose something that's a little bit different to the techno optimism. 
I worry there's a degree of um, if we know there's a plan B, yes. then it excuses what we do with the current Earth. I think that that's the thing that always scares me about this kind of thinking is it's kind of saying, well, there is an alternative future living on another planet, so we shouldn't get that hung up yeah. on what happens on this planet, which I guess is part of what you're capturing with the techno optimism, but maybe even more cynical and depressing. I, I, I think the techno optimism is just pure, pure, wow, wouldn't it be? Yeah, wonderful? I guess that it could be. But, but I've, I've heard that view. I haven't heard it for quite a while, but it's like in, 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 in the past few years I've heard that. Um, I think, I don't, I don't know, it's just, it's really hard for me to understand why you why you divert resources. Perhaps Elon, coming back to him, thinks I'm already doing stuff for the environment with electric cars. You know, that's my contribution. Therefore, I get a free pass on on this one. But I, very hard to understand. I think that's more like relying on God and theories and things. Sorry, you're right. The uh, the point that um. You, you want something that you can think, oh, well, that's okay. That will look after us. Isn't that like going to church and becoming religious? Yeah, I suppose it's like a yeah. yeah. Um, Energy. Is this just going to be masses and masses of solar arrays or what, what are they going to do to power everything? Um, I think solar and I think nuclear were invoked solar is at, is at risk up there because of the dust storms so even after the dust disappears your solar array would be coated in the point, yeah. in dust um and so we've got images of the uh the space probes you know the curiosity and so on just yeah. coated in dust which then miraculously can disappear again so the winds these winds that aren't very strong but are fast yeah. Can actually clear that dust. It's bizarre. Uh, okay. Anyway, th there's all sorts of weird things happening up there, yeah. uh, which is partly why I guess we want to visit it. Well, I think the solution's obvious. We just send Peter Dutton there. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that could be the first. Yeah, yeah. where are you going to put it? Okay. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, not really. If the winds couldn't clear the dust, it wouldn't have. Cause the windstorm, the dust storms in the first place. True, you true. Could only yeah. Lift fines. Yeah. 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 And the dust does hang around in the low gravity as well. That's part of, yeah. Okay. I'll probably overrun, haven't I, by a fair bit? All right. Thank you. How can DNA enhance research confirmation? Okay, we're going to go a little bit right to the other end of the scale. <laughs> Look at things you can't actually see on planet Earth. Um, we'll get it to the start. Is that start? No. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, speaking. <laughs> No. Um, so I'm kind of just going to talk about some of the things that genetics or DNA can help you with in research and in conservation. Um, so probably by now, most of you are aware that we have a genetics lab in Fenner um, and have had for the past few years. And so I'm mainly just trying to uh, use this as a little bit of an opportunity to give everyone a bit of an idea of the sort of work that's currently going on um, in the genetics lab and what sort of questions and issues that um, genetic tools can actually help us with. So I'm imagining most people have come across DNA now. Um, and when I talked to Rob about what to talk about, uh, one of the things was he said, um, take people into your world a little bit. This is going to be a little bit of a whirlwind tour and I kind of think that might be all right because that just might be my world. Um, so these are some of the projects, some of the organisms that um, we're getting samples coming through in the lab that we have people working on um, a whole range of different projects. Um, and we've pretty much got everything from 
um, various plant species coming through. We've got some reptiles, we've got invertebrates, we've got birds, we've got mammals. Um, so we're, we work on using genetic tools for a whole range of different reasons rather than a specific organism. So, um, oh, the things have moved a little bit. Um, so when we talk about genetic tools, um, particularly in conservation, there's kind of become two major groups of ways that you can use DNA. The first is what we probably traditionally think of um, when you talk about genetics and genomics, and that's to answer questions about how much genetic diversity is there in a population? Is it genetically healthy? Um, and then looking at the different ways that we can try and answer some ecological questions. So I think different populations connected, how far are individuals moving and dispersing through the environment? Who's mum and dad? Who's mating with who? Who's responsible for which offspring? Um, and we can actually even use genetic tools now to go back in history and look at the demographics of the population over time. Um, and of course we can use it to um, build phylogenies, look at the relationships between species, help resolve taxonomy, because um, sometimes you can't tell everything apart using morphology um, really effectively. And in the Genetics Lab in Fennel, we do all of these things, um, but we also use environmental DNA in various forms. So this is a tool that's really only become widely used in the last 10 years. Um, but it is very widely used and it is increasing. Um, and so it sort of originated with looking at microbial communities, um, particularly in waters and soils. Um, but actually all living things shed DNA into the environment. And our technologies now let us actually sequence the DNA so we can collect some soil samples, we can collect water, we can even collect air. And we can tell you a range of the things that are living in that community from vertebrates right through to fish in rivers, um, invertebrates in the community, not just these microbial um, organisms. So it's increasingly used a lot in biomonitoring to try and see what is living in a community. Um, particularly in terms of detecting threatened species or invasive species, because it can be quite sensitive. So just because you can't see it, genetic tools can sometimes detect it. Um, and one of the things that we're using it quite a lot for um, with a range of projects that I'm going to, one of which I'm going to talk about, um, is looking at diet and trophic interaction. So who's eating who and what? Um, and you can imagine in a lot of situations, particularly around restoration, and reintroducing a whole range of species is at some point, how well do you know what they're actually eating? So probably most of you know about the quolls and betongs that have been reintroduced into mulligans. So we introduce betongs, nice small little marsupial macropods, um, and then we introduced a predator. So what impact are the quolls having? What are they eating? Are they eating all the invertebrates? Are they eating all the betongs? Um, so we can address these sorts of questions, which are really hard to try and do using other methods. Um, and we can actually even identify individuals. So if we collect scats, um, we can actually use genetic tools to work out which individual produced that sample for us. Um, and then we can use that to track them um, through the environment, work out where they've been or work out what they've been eating. So it's a really, really, really handy tool. Um, and occasionally we slide slightly into the forensic side of things. Sometimes that can be wildlife forensics, so looking at wildlife crime. Um, but it can also be as simple as which predator killed my threatened species. Um, so I do periodically get sent from people. Um, here is a dead glider. Here is a dead koala. I have swabbed it. What killed it? Um, and that's actually really useful for understanding which predator species are impacting and whether it is an invasive cat or fox or whether it's a native predator. Um, and that's going to impact on how management is undertaken. So a couple of the projects um, that have been going on in the lab, and I'm mainly focusing on um, student projects here. Um, so this was some work done by Daniel Gauchi, um, who just a couple of weeks ago was awarded his PhD. Um, and he was working on Norfolk Island green parrot. 
So he wanted to look at the genetic health of these parrots because obviously they're on a small island. They've been known to have gone through multiple bottlenecks over the last, well, since they've been monitoring them, um, where only a handful of pairs were observed um, at any given breeding season. And so he wanted to look at um, how genetically healthy they were because there was a real fear that they might have all been brothers and sisters. Um, and that's obviously not going to be great for their conservation moving forward. Um, but what he actually found was there was, they weren't all brothers and sisters. They weren't breeding with relatives. There was relatively good diversity for what is an island population. Um, the effective genetic size in this population um, is just under 44, uh, which is not wonderful. Most populations, you would like to see that in the hundreds and thousands. Um, but considering this is a small island, um, it's only going to support a certain number of animals. And you could actually use the genetics to go back in time and test different models of what might have led to the current genetic situation. So was there a population bottleneck, a small number of animals founding um, the population on the island? Um, has that population then gone through another more recent bottleneck or not? Or has it always been the same? Um, and we actually, he did show that there was um, larger than the most recent bottleneck, but in the last past few generations, there's been quite a severe bottleneck, but they didn't start out with that much diversity anyway, because there were probably only a few thousand birds that colonized the island over a, a period of many years. So it gives us a bit of perspective on how to manage this population. Um, it wasn't the dire straits we thought it might have been, um, but we have a better understanding of how to address that now. Um, some work looking at little bronze cookers, so trying to understand uh, who's breeding with who and what's going on with the mating system. Um, so like most cookers, these guys are parasitic. This is the chick here, um, and it's fairy and it's wren parent um, who is looking after it and raising it. Um, and you can imagine that with cookers trying to work out the mating system or anything about their ecology is quite difficult because mostly you're observing adults or occasionally chicks in the nests of the hosts. Um, so we used the DNA from taken from chicks or eggs that were found in nests to look at how related they were to each other and using that piece together what the parentage of those individuals was. And actually what we found was there was quite a lot of little bronze cuckoos out um, in the environment, more than I've got here. So we went up to 46, no, 48. Um, a lot weren't related to each other. Half of them weren't related to each other. Um, but what we could also see were these complexes. So um, a lot of polygamy going on, males and females both breeding with multiple partners and producing um, eggs. So this is a very complex breeding system in this species, which would have been near impossible to disentangle if you weren't using genetic tools because um, you'd have a hard time observing these sorts of things. Um, so Eugene is taking on this project now with Naomi Langmore, um, and she's actually going to start to look at the evolution of the different morphologies um, in these little bronze cuckoos um, and the different subspecies. And so when we normally think of a host and a parasite evolving, um, we quite often think of this sort of tight coevolution of a host in the white and the parasite in the red. And the host develops a mechanism to try and outwit the parasite, and the parasite then counters that. Um, and we get these kind of tight evolution. But the alternative is that the parasite actually just finds a way to um, make use of multiple hosts. And it actually goes through a process of host shifting and then specialising and adapting to different situations. Um, and so usually is going to have a look at that and actually get try and get into the genetics of the different morphologies. So these are the same subspecies of cuckoo, um, and this is a different subspecies. Um, and you can see there's quite a big difference in skin colours, which then match their host species. 
Um, so this is a huge amount of morphological variation in the chicks. Um, and this might be part of the process of the different speciation and evolutionary events that are happening. So she's going to try and pin down the genes that are actually controlling those different color morphs to understand the taxonomy of these species, but also how they've evolved. And probably could go way over time. Um, birds without feathers. Um, so this is a pink tie worm lizard. Um, these are little legless lizards that live under rocks, um, predominantly in the ACT. So this was Kylie Morrow's masters. Um, she sampled them um, at the Gin and Dairy Conservation Corridor. And you can actually see the little blue dots are all the sites she sampled. These are one genetic group, and these little red ones down here are a different genetic group. So even over the space of a few hundred metres, there's quite a lot of differences in their genetics. Um, and we look at um, predicting dispersal pathways based on their genetics they're controlled by the presence of other populations, optimal habitat and creek lines. They don't like creek lines. Um, so what you can see is the predicted paths for some individuals, it's quite a long way. Um, you're gonna have to go a very long way around to get over here. So it gives us some insights into how well connected these different fragments are. Because obviously we're gonna have trouble radio tracking or following um, something of that size. And Kylie actually took it to using eDNA. So this is a pink tail worm lizard. That is my hand. So that is how small they are. Um, so we wanted to look at some alternative ways of sampling them. Um, and what Kylie actually found was that we can get enough DNA shed from an individual crawling across a bit of sandpaper here in this terrarium. So we can potentially <coughs> roll this idea of these little sandpaper swatches out. So current monitoring methods is to rock turn, which is a bit destructive, even where um, you use specific um, bricks or tiles, but the lizard has to be under there at that precise moment you turn it over for you to work out whether or not a lizard's there. We can put these little bits of sandpaper underneath that, come back a couple of days later and collect it, and we'll know if there was a lizard under there at any point in the last three days. So it really improves our ability to try and detect these little guys in the environment. So I mentioned the quolls. Um, so Sam Shipley did her honours looking at their diet um, and not surprisingly, they eat a whole lot of things. Um, what we expected was they ate a lot of invertebrates. Um, what they're doing is eating a lot of mammals, um, including kangaroos. <laughs> um, and one of the things here, it varies slightly across the seasons. You can see they do eat the bedongs, but only in winter. So if you're a bedong in winter, you need to watch out. Um, but actually what we find, so as a quoll, you're probably going to be eating multiple different insects, which is bringing these out. If you're eating um, an Eastern Grey, then you're only going to eat it once. And when we actually look at the reed counts and try and bring this into a slightly different perspective, they're eating a lot of macropods. Um, and most likely this is not them taking down an Eastern Grey kangaroo, um, but them feeding on carcasses. Um, particularly a lot of these samples were taken during the drought. Um, and so what we're actually looks like we're seeing with these reintroduced little eastern quolls is they're filling an empty niche out at Mulligan's Flat because there's no Tassie devils, there's no spotted tail quolls. They have very few, if any, competitors for a large carcass and they're making the most of it. And there's a lot of them. Um, so last one, um, this is Elise. She is currently doing her honours. She is, in fact, sitting in the lab now doing this. Um, and so she's looking at the microbes in soil. Um, and so she's been out sampling um, sites where mining waste has been deposited. And she is testing the different ways that they then cover that material with the aim of creating um, new natural habitat. So this is all going back to natural scrubland, if they can get it right. So she's going to look at the microbes and compare that to natural environments to try and build up a picture of what normal soil should look like to try and inform how they're going to manage that moving forward. And that's the end.
is there a like a new frontier are we i mean everything just keeps getting better and better but is there something i mean you know the environmental dna was a huge leap forward is there something else that we're all striving for in wildlife wildlife stuff where so environmental dna is still yeah. it's still progressing yeah. um and it, it's going to be the things we can do so it's going to be starting to pull dna out of the air and it's going to be yeah. you know not just sequencing little bits of dna it's going to be sequencing whole genomes all in one go right um but at the moment i think we're we're more in little steps of progression of yeah. how how little dna can you detect and how much can you sequence in one go that's right and and uh, this one um, I just had a question about the cost and, you know, comparative costs, you know, compared to other sorts of monitoring and whether there's any work looking at that because there's kind of increasing sort of pressure around monitoring but reducing the costs of monitoring. So there's been a little bit of work done in that over the years. The cost of sequencing is coming down dramatically um, and it is getting cheaper and cheaper. For some things, you still have to pay someone. It depends a bit on what your samples are going to be and what your question is going to be. Um, but they're really starting to kind of level out where the money that you can use in the lab that used to be the expensive bit, but it's it's leveling out so that you save that money by how you collect the samples. Um, but a lot of it depends on what your question is. Keep moving. Yep. Sorry. Okay. Mm, thanks. Um, so this is a very hastily put together talk and it's not even really research, but it's born out of oh, 20, 30 years of political frustration at climate policy going nowhere. Um, Australia having a carbon price back in 2012 that was then extinguished in 2014 and just thinking, why does it happen and <clears throat> could it ever be otherwise? And my initial title was a two act drama to cut Australia's greenhouse emissions. Those two acts are changes to the constitution and we've just seen last year how difficult changes to the constitution, otherwise known as a referenda, can be. So maybe it's more accurately titled constitutional dreaming. Um, and so I'm not proposing this as anything that's really seriously going anywhere. It's just my way of understanding how things are. And who knows what it might lead to in terms of could they ever change? But it's an idea that um, if you could dream of uh, having proportional representation, instead of single member constituencies and limits on political advertising that it could boost Australia's climate action. And if you like, that's my thesis. And I'll just sort of try to um, explain how that comes to be. And a sort of uh, simpler title could be, um, why is Australian climate policy so bad? And how could it be made better if constitutional reform were possible? And I hasten to um, point out this isn't actually research. Um, if anything, it's going to be campaigning of some kind or other, as in write op-eds or, you know, a Saturday newspaper or something or other. Um, and also, I've got no political science training and maybe I need some, but I have thought long and hard about it and have several conversations. Um, and recently, it was spurred by a couple of uh, ABC stories that many of you will have seen, which is the um, gas till beyond 2050 um, that was announced just before the budget um, by Madeleine King. Uh, and um, a re well, just last Sunday, Gareth Hutchins, um, a fairly interesting piece um, on the ABC um, titled Vested Interest Groups Putting Themselves Before Australia is a Time on a Tragedy, and essentially saying, um, how do, um, well, that vested interests groups are responsible for this particular weird policy that's come out of the Labour um, government still claiming to have serious climate policy, but um, happy, well, apparently happy to have um, gas expanding as opposed to contracting. And um, whatever I'm saying now obviously could well uh, apply beyond climate policy to all sorts of areas of climate policy. Um, but anyway, so that should be how do invested interests work. That's just a bit of hasty writing there. Um, and um, that's 
what I'm just about to say is my view of how vested interests work that, and this is the, the sort of two part that it's a combination of paid, paid political advertising by those vested interests um, with a focus on marginal electorates, um, those that have the most fossil fuel. When I say fossil fuel voters, I mean you know, the, 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 the voters who are likely to be in, um, in favor of foss fossil fuels con continuing or even expanding. Um, think various uh, marginal um, electorates in um, Western Australia and Queensland. And I thought I'd start actually with an older example, which uh, with the well-known example from the resource um, super profits tax in 2010. And this is just a little um, entry copied from Wikipedia um, that an ad war between the government and mining interests began in May 2010 and continued until the downfall of Prime Minister Kevin Rudd in June 2010 the um, AEC, that's the Australian Electoral Commission, estimated mining interest spent about $22 million in campaigning and advertising advertisements in the six weeks before the end of the Rudd Prime Ministership. And the point is that in spending $22 million and being free to spend $22 million on persuasive advertising, they protected billions of dollars worth of adverts. And this particularly upset me at the time living through it because of my British history. You can hear I'm British by origin. And in Britain, they actually have um, very tight controls on political advertising. You simply can't, as a, um, a commercial company, just buy airtime and say, we don't like this policy. If it's political and, um, uh, and it's to do with government policy, um, there's limits on uh, freedom of speech in Britain, quite tough limits. Um, I mean, all sorts of political address get around it, but it, it, it is significant in reducing the amount of political advertising by um, special interests. And it also applies to polit politicians themselves advertising their policies in that you have party political broadcasts. Um, and the point of all this is that it's the um, combination of these two things of um, interests, vested interests being able to spend money um, on advertising without much restraint and focusing on marginal electorates that sways these policies in ways that um, are undesirable, I would say. So a possible solution, the, the first act, if you like, is um, to uh, ban paid political advertising. Now, not many of you know this, and I have done a tiny bit of research. I published a, a, a short paper in 2014 because I was just so intrigued as to how the 2010 um, resource super profits tax had happened, and also how the um, carbon tax had been act, axed um, by about 2014. You could see it happening. And discovered this um, in a 2007 paper, there was an attempt by the um, uh, Labour Party government in the early 1990s to legislate a British style ban on paid political advertising on television and radio. Uh, the ban, which applied to all levels of parliamentary elections, was short lived because the High Court during an unusual bout of judicial activism, declared the ban unconstitutional in this 1992 judgment reference there. And the formal reasoning was distinctly American lying in the discovery of a freedom of political communication implied, note, implied in the democratic structure of the constitution. So that basically means if you want to limit political advertising in this country, you're gonna to have to overturn this high court judgment. I'm not enough of a lawyer to know whether that can be done by an act of parliament or whether it would require a referendum, but it's obviously tougher than if this judgment hadn't come down. And I'm suggesting that a uh, second act, the uh, second part of the solution is to have some form of um, proportional representation. Got a question there already? Uh, oh, good Lord. I'm, thank you, thank you, thank you. Whoops. Yes, I'm um, wrong screen. Um, so yes, um, so it's to avoid policy being driven by marginal electorates. So very quick straw poll. Um, how many of you have ever voted in an electorate where you really felt your vote mattered because the electorate was marginal? Okay, a few. I mean, I ask that question because I have never in my entire life <laughs> lived in an electorate where I didn't know exactly who the MP was going to be. Um, and, and therefore, you know, I really felt disenfranchised to the extent that nothing, nothing I could ever vote was ever going to make a difference. And um, it just, 
I've just seen so much bad policy happen in this country because of the emphasis on marginal electorates. And I mean, same sort of principles apply to the Electoral College in the USA. I mean, so much of whether Donald Trump or Joe Biden gets elected depend on a few thousand voters in just a few states um, because California doesn't matter and Texas doesn't matter. We know what they're going to do. So it's the same principle that um, some form of PR um, makes every vote count and stops the um, kind of pork barreling and special interest pleading and just has a policy that's made more for the whole country. Um, with proportional representation, of course, you have coalitions. Well, of course, we have a coalition. It's been in power for nine years. But nevertheless, when you have an election like you had in Tasmania that results in um, no uh, clear majority, then the current um, comments you get on and in, in political writing tends to be, oh, what chaos we have. Look, this is a bad outcome. We need a definite government. And I'm, I guess I'm suggesting that culture could change so that coalitions aren't seen as bad things. Um, and post-election haggling and negotiation is seen as simply, OK, that's what the, the voter, the electorate wanted. And so we've got to have parties to combine with it. Well, um, negotiate with each other to um, form some sort of policy platform, which is more representative of the country's wishes as a whole. Um, and yeah, I, I have specific views on what Julie Gillard should have um, said on joining the, uh, well, in leading the minority Labour government in 2010, if she sort of said, yes, I know I said no carbon tax, but look, I'm a minority government. I had to strike a deal with these three independent MPs and this is the price. And that being part of a normal Australian electoral conversation and not being considered as a complete sin against what the electorate had asked for, I think that could have changed the culture and maybe um, saved the carbon tax, uh, carbon price, whatever you want to call it, um, from the end that it came to um, under the Abbott government. But of course, um, there's all sorts of influences on politics. Um, the internet problem remains. Um, we still have um, the, there's a, a particular act in the US, I hadn't named it there, that's got the section 230, which defined internet providers as not publishers. This is way back in the 1990s. And that's why all the, I don't know what to call it, but all the rubbish and dangerous rubbish that appears on the internet um, is so hard to deal with. And I mean, good luck to the e-safety commissioner um, in Australia at the moment, um, taking on X and Elon Musk, second mentioned this flash talk. Um, but um, I would say the best hope lies in the EU's 2024 Digital Services Act, which I only heard about um, a month or two uh, ago, that is going to really try to rein in some things. And that's about it. So there's your flash talk. Okay. <laughs> Questions? Comments? Sure. Thinking about the I'm glad you raised the issue of the internet because when you're talking about the paid political advertising, I was thinking, well, in some ways it's arguably not relevant anymore because the old form of political advertising is is not that relevant. They're like yeah. the kind of campaign that was... How many, well, actually, just how many people are influenced by TV adver adverts? Well, how many people are exposed to TV adverts? Yes. I mean, I think that's the question. Certainly my children would never come across an advertisement on television. Right. Never. Yep. <laughs> Obviously, they're still exposed to advertising, but yep, they're but exposed to the internet. So, yeah, I guess the point in, that I struggle with is mm -hmm. even if we recognise that the internet are publishers, you still have this problem that the way they the way they connect with their audience is just so different that, you know, you're, <laughs> they can communicate to sectors. You know, we you can have no idea what's being said to the person next to you through media because you're in a different bubble, that, that yep. kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, definitely a comment rather than a question. Sure. I find it hard to understand how democracy works in the presence of the internet. I yes. Guess. I mean, that, that's why that last three lines are possibly pretty, you know, the, as important as the rest of it put together, um, because it, the internet is just so influential in forming people's opinions. So. We, we talked about transformative change last week in the oh, first yeah. talk. So yeah. were you here? And uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and so I guess 
you know, I've thought about this too. You know, I could just replace climate change with biodiversity right through here. You sure. know, it's similar problems. And, yep. um, I, you know, I've thought about this too, you know, like, well, everyone, if you read all the big reports, they say we need transformative change, but they don't know how to get there. And mm. I don't think from my experience, I don't think you can command and control your way out of it with legislation, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I just think, reading and listening to others and my own experience is that I think it's got to be much more holistic, you know? So, and it's got to be, um, and the OECD, when they reviewed, you know, environment policy in Australia, I thought that was the best. You know, they said, one, we need leadership, you know, two, we need social, you know, very strong social license sort mm -hmm. of pressures. Sure. And we need legislation, you know, sort of the backup. Um, you, you need, but you need bipartisan support, you know, once your legislation comes in, it needs bipartisan support because it just doesn't last otherwise. And that's happened in so many areas of environment policy. So I'm just saying that, you know, I, I like, I just think it's one piece of the puzzle. Sure. I mean, and I, and I, what I, all those other pieces are, I don't know if anyone knows the answer to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I mean, I'm just pulling out two sort of big pieces, if you like, of the puzzle, um, yeah. I think of the electorate structure and, and advertising. Is that it's, it's, a, it's a dream. Um, totally agree with your take on our need for PR. Um, democracy is broken because everyone's targeted at the marginal electorates. And if New Zealand can go to PR, you know, why can't we? Mm -hmm. Why are we so freaking conservative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and interesting. I'm not sure if it was a question or a comment. No, no, but I, I didn't expect necessarily questions because I couldn't yeah. answer them. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> throw it out there. Yeah. It's um, yeah, but it I, seems I mean, fundamental it's, it's, to it the It is change. really interesting reading yeah. how New Zealand got there in about three three steps, um, yeah. three successive elections. Yeah, yeah. Um, although I must admit, it doesn't look particularly pretty at, in New Zealand at the moment. But, no, uh, that's right. I mean, yeah. Not guaranteed to work, but it's just better on average. Yeah. I mean, it's to be honest, why I, I I'm hoping and praying for a minority government at the next election. Yeah. Um, because it might just force some constitutional change. That's right. Maybe it will happen by default. Yeah.